second half. In there, strike three called. And Alonzo cracks one of the best with the ball game. Out of sight. A two-run Alonzo loses it. Jump shot. And a jump on home. Hi, everybody, and welcome to a sad edition of the Mets way. The New York Mets have been eliminated from the 2022 MLB playoffs by the San Diego Padres, losing two to one in the wild card series. <sighs> Jimmy, yeah. why did you make that? You just reminded me when things were good, and now it, it all feels like crashing back into my heart. I figured because like. In the off season, you know that that like I actually just like <laughs> that whole montage made me like very like I was kind of fine and now I'm like back to being sad again. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think that should it's a good thing. We got to be sad. We got to be right where we feel right after the loss. I don't because, know if we have to, but you know, we will. I'm sad. Like, I'm sad because like the like you know don't be sad that it's over like smile because it happened and i will and like but i don't know just seeing like those those moments right there like oh just think of all the joy this team brought me and how much time i think we all kind of invested in it this year and now that's just it's just gone like that um i think that's the worst part you know yeah now that i had a few days to take away from it though and think on it you know, because I know I was saying for a while, it's like this season's a failure. This season's a failure, which right now it still is a failure. But like, well, I'll get into it later. But you know, when we get into it, I'll explain my uh, takeaways. So, what was your guys' like moment? Where you're like, oh, this this is done. Because like for me, it was like the second Bassett gave up that first run, and then the Hassan Kim walk. I was like, oh. Season's over. I got I got the next hour to prep by the fourth inning. And I was like, all right, I can watch House of the Dragon tonight. Awesome. And I put that on. I watched some uh, dragon incest stuff and um, made me feel kind of worse. So, you, you, know. you didn't you didn't go down with the ship. You don't I, I, just don't, I, I don't want to watch the last out. I just I can't. Oh, I, I can't like watch them flail for like three more innings that Joe Musgrove and the Padres bullpen. And be like, well, we tried. It's like I don't want to see that. Get out of here. I wouldn't say flail. It was more of like a sl- like a slow. Like we had a small cut, and they like held us upside down, and they just kind of watched the blood like <laughs> slowly. Like, yeah, it was a slow bleed out of a game. Uh, I thought it was over when Canna hit that one into the gap in right field, mm. and Grisham just made like an amazing like a gold glove play like it was like i was like fuck like this is <laughs> like, uh, like what what are we gonna do at this point like that was pete alonzo was on first you know we finally could have had like some kind of rally going and they just yeah he made the play like damn that that was yeah it when alonzo yeah that, i was gonna say jared that's that was the same exact uh when i realized too you know i know Every single Met fan in that stadium, I think, felt the same way, too, because we were so excited. We were like, all right, you know what? Screw it. We're down. But it's it's, if it's the last game of the year, we can't go down without a fight. So, you know, the crowd was getting into it. (laughs) I mean, at that point, it was for nothing. Like, it's still a winnable game. It is a winnable. Yeah. And, you know, we've seen the Mets come back before. It's just lately their offense have been so dead. So it was just so hard to even get Mets fans like, to even get behind them. But, you know, we did like the fans did end up getting behind them. When Alonzo got that first hit, it was like, all right, finally, like somebody got to Musgrove finally. And then Canna hits a rocket. That ball was like, it was scorched off the bat. I thought for sure. I thought Alonzo's, I thought his big ass was going to score from first base. Like I really did. I thought for sure. I was like, all right, finally, we're going to get a run. Canna just, he just sealed the deal, getting uh, getting clutch hits all year. Like, this is going to spark a comeback. Here we go. And then, like you said, Trent Grisham, who basically 
uh, Evan Roberts and on his Rico Bronga podcast, <laughs> he was calling him Babe Ruth, and that's literally what he played like this series. He's like Rico. literally, yeah, that's 160 all year, and then just turns into Babe Ruth this series. And the interesting thing about Grisham and also on the Rico, um, he was saying like Grisham when he was on the Brewers had like a terrible error against the Washington Nationals. Um, and now he's he's back in the playoffs and he had a great performance. So like, good for him. Like that's like I'm happy for him. Like that's that's great for his career and everything. But the saddest part about just what you said, what made me even sadder, is it's because of that error he got traded to San Diego. So if he just fields that ball cleanly, number one, the Nationals probably won a World Series. That'd be cool. Um. And number two, he's not on the Padres, so he's then not given the chance to beat the piss out of us um, this weekend. So it, was, it all comes full circle. It was funny. None of us picked. I remember we all picked X Factors or potential Met Killers in the preview show. I picked Profar. Um, when you guys picked Cronenberg, pretty good on that one. Profar yeah. did kill. <laughs> he killed oh. us, the, and especially in game two. Even though we won, that dive he had. Um, I think it was a Nimmo single down like the left field line, like. Three runs would have scored. Like it would have been a ba- or no, it was like, it would have been like a bases clearing, like single or double. And he had the sick diving play, and it you know it held a couple of runs on, but he killed. But none of us picked Grisham. None of us picked Grisham. I mean, I mean we should have been like, well, who's the worst player? And been like, duh. Yeah, of course we make yeah. the worst players look good, and the we make you Darvish. Granted, you Darvish is a beast, but. Like, come on, you Darvish and Musgrove. We make them look like we made them look like what Jacob DeGrom and Scherzer should, should have been. Like, that's I think that's the best way to put it. And like that bottom of the lineup, the seven, eight, nine with Kim, Grisham, and uh, Nola. I don't think that's the right order. I think it's switch Grisham the, and Kim. Your point but, stands. Yeah. Yeah. Nola yeah. was bat ninth. I think, they, so. they played like that was like they were playing Met baseball. Mm-hmm. Those the three. Bottom you know, of the lineup killed they were getting hit by pitches. They were walking. They were taking good at bats, and they were just like knocking in singles and moving guys along on the bases. It's like the one yeah. thing we did all year and cannot do in that playoff series. And that those last three guys did it. So good for them. But fuck. I feel like they messed up Bassett's timing a lot, very well in that game. I'm, I didn't really notice that first from the crowd, but when I did rewatch the highlights. It felt like he like he was up in the count, and I mean ahead in the count, a lot on guys. Even when he walked them, it's just you know the calling a timeout like mid at bat, stepping out of the box, you know, just messing with his head, and then he was just thrown off. And then like you know that even um, when they scored their first two runs, we had you know it was just one runner on, and there was two outs. Like he easily could have gotten out of that, but then they just kept just messing with Bassett's timing and it just got to him. I feel like, and you know, all year Bassett's one thing not to get too much on Bassett, but all year, the one thing that, you know, he's been great all year, obviously, but obviously some starts he struggled, but whenever he struggles, it's cause he's wild. And you know, the walks were coming and you know, just, just too late. The bats didn't pick him up. It just sucks. I wish one time when someone stepped out, he just told him to step right back in. Like, I, I mean, that's no fault of his own. I don't think we would have changed the outcome of the game, so I'm not going to sit here and be like, if he had done this, we would have won. Because obviously there's far more issues of what happened in game three than just that. But I just wish at one point, just, be like, just get in the box, man. Like, Because I feel like the crowd, I'm like, oh, yeah, let's go. Like, it's, it's a throw down here. But he just, like, I mean, I can't blame him for just, like, trying to stay within himself and everything like that. But, like, it just felt like everything that could go wrong did in, in game one and game three. Um which I guess should lead us to like the chronological order of what happened. The series um, game one was a nightmare. I was watching the new Hellraiser movie with the game on <laughs> and I wish I just kept watching Hellraiser because it was more of a horror show than um, or the Mets game was more of a horror show than the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was um, I did not expect that at all. You know, I even said it in the chat. I was like, Scherzer's locked in. The Mets Twitter said Scherzer's locked in. They got the black uniforms on. The crowd's going. We were trying to change the narrative of the black uniforms. We got new Max Scherzer. It's these Mets. It's different. 
And then these Mets just got slapped, slapped around. Scherzer just literally got like he just got blown up in his face. Like that was he he got hit hard. And you guys have been saying it all year too. Like uh, on like um in a couple other shows, like even against the Yankees, like he gets hit hard. And against that Brave series, like granted he did obviously suck, but when when they were just making contact, it was just hard contact and. I don't know if I'm as worried as some people are about Scherzer, but it was, it was a little interesting. I mean, he is. It's just like we're gonna talk about game one. It's it's just embarrassing, dude. It's it's freaking <laughs> embarrassing. It, it, it is, and you Darvish is great. The Padres are a really good team. Like if they weren't in a division with Dodge, the Dodgers, they'd have a lot more wins. I think if they put them in our division. The central division, like they would have a much better record than they did. I think they only won like what 89 games. Mm-hmm. Um, they're a really good team, and they're still missing one of their best players. Um, but like pay a guy 42 million dollars. He has all this huge pedigree. He talks about how he relishes moments like this. Ah, ah. like only only the Mets. Only the Mets can make a guy that good, and that guy of someone who's consistently good through his whole career absolutely shit the bed in the two most and his most important start of the season. Like, it's just like ah, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. That's all I have to say about game one. And Eduardo Escobar, I mean, when he hit that home run to make it 7 1, I had a little hope. I had a little hope. I was Why? Listening. Don't do that yeah. to yourself, Jared. And you know what, though? I want to get on the people. Playoffs and it's September, Eddie. Like, it's. <laughs> he was know, pumped. He was, he was pumped. pumped. The crowd was pumped. I was listening in the car. I'm like, I don't know if I can leave my car. I might just drive around my neighborhood for the next, like, hour, however left was left in the game. Yeah. These Didn't were supposed out. to be yeah, like- these Mets. <laughs> and now they're those. I, I want to talk those. about the branding of this team real quick while we're on it. Um, I'm going to use my one curse per episode now. Never fucking do that again. Yeah. These Mets, agree. awful slogan. Awful. Give me something else. It's not that it's awful. It's like they got a slogan before they actually ever did anything. That too. Like at least the the 1973 Mets, the, you got to believe. Like that's where it started because Tug McGraw said it in an interview, the Mets closer at the time. Also Tim McGraw's father, which is pretty cool. Um, But he's like, you know, like because they were – at the bottom of the NL East, and they went on a crazy run. And it kind of just like that run carried them from the second half of the season all the way through the playoffs and the World Series where they lost to the A's. But they like kind of earned that nickname. Like these Mets, I don't know. It just like came, it's like this probably came out of some like marketing meeting. They're like, oh, it's a great idea. It wasn't like organic. It wasn't what something like the player said. It wasn't something like Gary Cohen said. It was just, mm-hmm. ugh. And they put it on the towels. Like, oh. Ugh. It's just stupid. I had to throw the towel out. Good. I'm glad you did. Keep it. I'm glad you did. The the second part of the branding, those I don't want to see the black jerseys ever again. Okay, they're stupid. They're ugly. I I just (laughs) I I I don't. I'm done with them. I'm done with them. I like them for Fridays. No, no, no never, never again. I don't ever want to see them again. Yeah, I I I don't either. I, I don't. I don't want to see him in big games, but I still like the black uniforms. They are a cool look. <laughs> they're not that cool. I don't want to get side. They're not that cool. I can we just can we just be honest? They're not that good. <laughs> they're 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 just not okay. It reeks of the two thousands and just being like, whoa, it, uh, uh, goth stuff's in. Let's do black. Let's no, you're the Mets. You're blue and orange. Never do black. It's not your color. Okay, it's it's at most your fourth color. It's your tertiary color is, is orange. Tertiary Give me an orange, orange jersey before I, I get a black one. Okay, orange Enough jersey would be heat. I want to see an orange jersey. Yeah, not black. We've never used black. It's so. Uh... The blue one is nice too. I like the blue one. I like. Yeah, the wear blue. that more. They yeah, got it. They do got to wear that more. They should have wore the blue on uh, Friday night, or they should have wore it for Game Three or or Game Two, like Game Three. And you Change know it up a little bit. I just I turned around. I love the pinstripes. And the one World Series win that we had against the Royals in 2015, 
was in the blue uniform right there, Syndergaard. Just saying. Maybe maybe you guys are on to something. Maybe the blue uniforms should be worn now. Well, now we got to lose a game in them. We gotta wait till April. Oh yeah, the, we did lose in yeah, Harvey five, right? right there the, <laughs> in that one right there. Yeah, yeah. could have um, won that game. Uh, all right. So game, game, game two, I guess, because that was the only positive. Like that was yeah. everything. I mean, I sent the New York Groove song in the group chat. We were all, everyone was feeling it. You know, Lindor delivered, Pete delivered, Degrom delivered, McNeil delivered. Nimmo went three for three or, or three for four. Like it was awesome. Manu Fat runs. Daniel Vogelback got a sacrifice fly. Things Darren were looking Ruff good. Got on base twice. <laughs> <laughs> he got on base twice. Um, my game two experience was very odd um, because I was just locked in my room for the most part. Um, I was wearing a like winter jacket, which is behind me. Um, there it's covering now my Mets jersey. I don't want to see that Mets jersey till April. Um, and I was in like I wore jeans, a t-shirt, this this winter coat, despite the fact it was like 50 degrees out, and I held this all game long. It's just a baseball bat. And I stood. I stood for at least four to five innings. I didn't sit down once. In between innings, I have to walk around my room to keep circulation going. Because I was like, so this is another tangent here. I hate the Pats. I hate them with a passion. I know them from New England. I don't care. They're, they're stupid. They suck. Um, they made the <laughs> whole A's irrelevant. <laughs> um, but during that eagles Pat Super Bowl, I stood the entire game. So I brought that energy to the Mets, and good things happened. Um, and I'm you not going to say that's why it happened. You didn't want to stand for game three? I did. I tried. Okay. I wear the same coat. I wore the same jeans. I, I held the bat and I stood and it didn't change nothing. It's just, I mean, okay. So game two, I don't even know what to say. It all just feels like I want to be like, wow, that was great. But then I remember game three happened and I'm like, it doesn't matter. None of this matters. Yeah. Game two for me, I think it made me realize that it made me realize one that uh, I want to see Jacob Degrom back on this team at all costs. Pay the man. Oh, yes. Pay the man. Um, <laughs> I'm full on board now. Um, that's an, that's for later though. And also the stars showed up. You know, it just I think it showed you when our stars show up, we can win. You know, Alonzo, Lindor, Vogi. You know, I'm not saying he's our star, but it helps. Yeah, when, I don't know why you included him. He's third. our offensive center. <laughs> it just helps when you're about. the guy you, uh, the guy, when the guys you acquired at the trade deadline made an impact in that game for mm -hmm. the first time in I felt like forever. So for me, I took away like, oh my god, Darren Ruff and Vogelback, they could change the narrative of the the trade acquisition just by performing well like they did in this game. But Darren Ruff, he didn't really perform well. He just got on base. But granted, just to, like Lindor and Alonzo and Degrom, them them three. You know, to see them just perform the way they did in big moments. And even Alonzo, his second hit of the game, I thought when he hit that home run, it, it really was just a, a confidence booster for Alonzo. And then obviously should hit the fan the next game. I mean, he still did get a base knock the next game, and he was the only one who got a base knock, so I can't just get, get on him completely. But I felt like when Alonzo hit that home run, he realized like, okay, like, you know, I can fucking do this. Like, I can, like, I'm a beast. I'm a 40 home run guy and 130 RBI guy in the regular season. But in the postseason, uh, he was nervous, it felt like, at times in game one. And even in that Braves series. But game two, it felt like, okay, Alonzo can get the job done under pressure. And now he realized it. And that I felt like that second hit proved that. But then uh, the rest of the offense, even though the rest of the game, it just wasn't, it wasn't there. I mean... It just in game two, obviously it was obviously we won, but it didn't feel like it didn't feel like anything crazy because for most of the game it was it was you know you're on the edge of your seat you know you were walking around with your bat and then even in the ninth inning you know we're we're like like out of you know like I didn't want to say it you said you were scared Josh I was like no dude no way we pull this and then I the game and I'm like I oh didn't shit watch it. yeah then I'm like oh shit we might blow this but there's just like. Moments in that game where I was just like, you know, I was like, I saw what happened in game one and game three in game two. 
It's just I feel like we had one big inning and uh, McNeil capitalized. I mean, that one big inning, it was like 45 minutes. Like it, yeah. was, it was the longest Met game or one of the longest Met games. It was like four hours and like 19 minutes. But that one inning was like that was that was how our team at our best all year when we did things like that. So I thought it was like, okay, look, like this kind of style of play, like it can work in the playoffs. But to go back to Lindor's home run, you could see the look on his face when he hit that, like the relief and like the pressure that got taken off of him. I thought that was really cool. And then watching the Pete home run, I was like, come on, Pete, like give us like a moment, give us like a signature moment for you to like, kind of be like, I'm here. I've arrived in the playoffs. And what was the first pitch? Just like absolute missile. Like knew it was gone immediately. I thought that was awesome. Probably one of my favorite moments all year. Um, even the Lindor home run, but the Pete Alonso home run, that was what make it a three, two game at that point. Yeah. That was huge. With the Grom um, pitching too. Yeah. And the Grom's last inning also like, just pay the man do whatever it takes. I cannot, I do not want to see him in another uniform at all. I don't like, I don't think I could stomach that. Keep him here. It'd be, it'd be almost as bad as Nolan Ryan. Um, not Nolan Ryan. Who am I thinking of? Tom Seaver from the Reds. Yes. It's as bad as the midnight <laughs> massacre. It's as bad as that. As bad as Tom. Wow. I'm embarrassed. Um, it would be as bad as Tom Seaver leaving. Keep Jacob DeGrom at all costs. Obviously he doesn't have the ring yet, but keep that man, pay him. Um, cause that was just awesome. Simple man in the, I bumped simple man in my car before I like went in my house to like watch the game. And like that just, that was, that was awesome. I was just like alone screaming in my car. It was great. Um, I had to get locked in as the ground was getting locked in himself. Um, so I think there's a lot of positives from game, from game two. Um, Diaz came in and can we talk about the ESPN broadcast? Before we get to game three. I just wanted to say real quick, the difference between our song choices, Jared, before the game is just like, tells you everything you need to know. You're bumping simple man. I'm bumping O to the Mets. And I'm like, well, got to prepare myself. <laughs> and if the audience doesn't know, O to the Mets is a song. The strokes wrote what Julian Casablanca wrote after the 2016 playoff loss on his way to the uh, subway. And it chronicles just like every feeling you feel as a Mets fan. And I was just like, hey, I'm going to bask in the darkness. Let's go. I was the whole day like, we're going to lose. Doom and gloom. Um, but the, ESPN, the ESPN telecast. Terrible. They actually have no, like Eduardo Perez, moron. David Cohn, all right. Colorado, yeah. okay. And it's I feel like little... the... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I just felt like the ESPN broadcast just tries to do too much. It's just they don't have any chemistry, and they actually acknowledge that in game three. Um, but it's just like it made losing those games so much worse having to hear them talk about the Mets that way, talk about the Padres, talk about anything. Like, there weren't funny, there's no jokes, they're not like laughing. Like, it makes you really appreciate um, Gary, Keith, and Ron, and I mean, any other booth. I would take Michael K calling. Oh, ESPN wildcard game. No, and I don't, I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't I don't like Michael K, but I like him more. I would rather have K and a rod than ravage and the other two guys, except cone cone was all right. See, like they do that in all, all other sports. Like, you know, Mike Breen broadcast for the Knicks. He calls big ESPN playoff games. Like why can't Gary Cohen is one of the best play by play. He's about to go to the, like the baseball broadcast hall of fame. Got and, yeah. Um, which is awesome. Imagine he get if if he gets in the Hall of Fame, you think he tells Keith like makes one of Keith like, hey, I'm in the Hall before. <laughs> but that's <laughs> um. But anyways, yeah, I just feel like baseball should let even Michael K. You know, let Michael K. announce a game. Let Gary Cohen announce a game because I'd rather even like tonight's game, like tonight's Yankees versus Guardians game. I wouldn't mind hearing Gary Cohen call that and Michael K. Like you said, call our game. Like flip flop, I don't care. Make it interesting because honestly, it would be It'd give Yankee fans a taste of Mets fans. It give everybody else like a taste, and you know these guys also have chemistry with each other, working with each other. Like you said, Jared, they don't have chemistry because 
ESPN only broadcast baseball games once a week tops. To answer your question about that, it's really not any more simple than just like corporations. That's just the way it is. In the sense that ESPN has so many commentators on staff, they're not going to go out of the way to pay someone else to come in for maybe a three game set or a two game set at most of its sweep. So they're just going to use who they have in house. And that's why TBS has games and you're hearing like NFL announcers or a college announcer calling the game alongside um, and Ron Darling. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) And Bob Costas and TBS are owned by such and such. And they know Bob Costas. So they'll get Bob Costas for the game. It's as simple as that, unfortunately. And Michael K got the, the difference because he worked for ESPN this year. So he was already on the books and that's kind of how sad it is. And Ron Darwin is also employed by TBS and we're never going to hear an actual regional guy. The only example that I can ever think of is um, Joe Davis, who's calling the um, Braves Philly series is the play-by-play guy for the Dodgers, but that's because Fox signed him. (laughs) It's just how it goes. And we're never going to hear Gary Cohen call a playoff game. Your best you're going to do is probably Howie Rose. And that is another tragedy of MLB. ESPN signed Gary Cohen. No, no, keep him on SNY. I want him for every Met game. But no, the- like keep him on SNY. Do a little. Do a keep little Keith on here. SNY. What are we talking about? Did okay? Did the whole season go wrong when Keith got out? Like when yes, was- kind of. What was what was it? Milwaukee or Oakland? That he- I think we thought Oakland. he sacrificed he himself at first, <laughs> and then he got. No, it was not. And look at the Phillies. He makes fun of them, and now they're up 1-0 on the Braves. Got a bad feeling about that. I really, honestly, I kind of hope the Padres come out of the NL. No, don't say that. Because either Dodgers, Braves, or Phillies. We're so off track, but don't say that. <laughs> and I honestly think the I, I think the Padres are going to. I think they got hot at the right time. Oh, my God. I'm telling you. They got Dude. hot because they played a bad team, man. We're a bad they, team. Let's just be honest not, about the Mets. They got they got guys though. Machado, Soto. Like, we have they're flaws. talented. They're ta- I think they're talented enough to beat the Los Angeles Dodgers. <laughs> okay, do you I want you to re say that again. I think the Padres can beat the LA Dodgers in a five okay, game but series. You realize and you're like, man, the Padres are talented. The Dodgers are like yeah, we have an all-star one through nine and a pitching staff that is all great. I'm just look, I, we're all way off track, so I, I'm yeah. just gonna roll with it. But like, if the Dodgers don't win, that's a bigger choke than the Mets because the Dodgers at least have seen the Padres 19 times this year and murder them every time for the most part. So if they do don't do this, then like egg on your face, Los Angeles, which is why I'm rooting for them. I don't want to deal with San Diego anymore. Get get out of my face. It would make it so Mets if. Freaking Musgrove comes out in that Dodger in the Dodger series and I don't, has like, I don't the shit on that. his ear again, <laughs> and then it actually comes out that it's shit on his ear. It's like pine tar and he gets tossed. Perfect transition. Let's talk about Game Three. The slow, we, the slow death that we all witness. I think we all agree that we kind of touched on it earlier. The seven, eight, nine, the Grishams. We kind of all knew when it was over at certain points. Um. You know, Grisham catching Canada's fly ball. Josh, I forget what you said. Um, I think it was when Kim got hit by one of the pitches. When Kim and Grisham walked to load the bases, and it was still two outs, and knowing that Bassett was up one two on uh, Kim at that time, and then to have that happen, I was like, oh, it's over. Because all all they need is a single here. This game's wide open. As we've talked about this entire season, for the most part, at least the back half of it. Um, and like I was telling Jimmy before you joined Jared, the Mets are kind of wimps where if they get down to like a four run or worse lead, at least as of late, they're just like, well, that's the game. Sorry, guys. You guys can go home. You can turn the TV off because we're not going to come back because we don't have the power to. And the worst part is the Mets offense is getting on a roll early. It's nights out because they're just I don't know what that is. I don't know, like don't tell me you're mentally strong, everybody, because you aren't <laughs> at least in situations like that. Um, but that's what I knew. Well, sometimes, I don't know, like sometimes you just run into a guy like Joe Musgrove, who is, you know, he's like, all right, tonight I'm just going to have the best game of my life. And what do you like? What are you going to do? Like, it's just, it's, it's just though the offense, they like we saw a, three Braves pitchers arguably have one of the best nights of their lives in that series. Um, we saw you Darvish just absolutely dominate us for the probably like the 
a thousand five hundred forty second time, and then it just you make these pitchers Darvish and Musgrove, and even Blake Snell they couldn't score off him. They I mean granted they worked the count and got him out of the game, but uh, Jesus my dog. But she's um, in mourning too, Jimmy. Let her grieve. <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah, my um, I think like. You know, it's it's even extra embarrassing because, you know, we do have going into the series. It was like, okay, you know, Scherzer is going to go game one because we have Jacob deGrom. He, he's going to go game three if we need him. And, you know, we're going to save him for the Dodgers series. And it's like we're talking out of our ass, talking like we're going to get to the second round. And then Darvish shows up, Scherzer doesn't. deGrom showed up, but Musgrove showed up, and Bassett didn't. So I think game three really was the worst. I feel like game three was just, like you said, it was a slow, slow death. And it just felt like game three was a game that described the whole season towards the end. Where like Josh even said, you know, they go up even two or four runs. And it just feels like this offense has no chance in coming back. Because it's just been so stagnant. It, they, they show no fight. And at the beginning of the year, they're like, oh, we love playing down. We love playing down. We'll come right back. Well, you were down in the Brave series. You didn't come back. You were down. You were down. They were. There was a winnable game all Sunday. It was a winnable game. They were right in it. You know, you get one guy on base, you hit a home run. It's a tie game. Two, it's 2-2 two, two right there. No you know, even and No walk. Yeah. You know, even like... It's just so frustrating because they didn't even put up a fight. They didn't even make it interesting. They only had one hit. It's just this offense, it just showed you, like Josh had, they are wimps. They they did not come up when it needed to be done. And I'm not going to say this 101 season was useless, but, you know, the Padres have 89 wins and they're advancing. You know, we have 101 wins and we're not. Yeah, the offensive approach in game two was a wet dream to me. And it's exactly what I've talked about all season long when the Mets are right. It's what they do. Work the count, stress the pitcher. Again, those first two innings and everything, even in the third to some extent, they weren't the prettiest in game two, and they didn't get any runs across, I want to say, besides the home run ball. But they got that pitch count up, which lets them get to the bullpen early, which gets you worse relievers later on, especially once the inning kind of piles on and Adrian Moron, or whoever you pronounce it. Moron. Just <laughs> okay, well, come on. That's how they were. It wasn't me. That was the fans at City Field chanting. It was well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the reason you face him is because of the discipline and the fight you show early in the game. And you go from that to this nightmare in game three, where if you look at the, the most amount of pitches Musgrove threw in a single inning, it's 16. Oh, that's it. Because the Mets, I didn't feel like they were very patient. They didn't feel like they were trying to foul off balls. It was just like, we got this, and they just let Musgrove play to them instead of Musgrove, or instead of trying to go after Musgrove, kind of bit by bit. And it was a complete collapse of the entire mentality of what actually won them game two. Because when you look at that any that rally late on in that game, there wasn't any home runs. It was singles and walks and grinding at bats from Mark Canna that worked. None of that game three. That's a kudos and a credit to Joe Musgrove, by the way, who didn't allow that to even happen. Compare that with Blake Snow, whose control was all over the place. So kudos does go to him, of course. But the Mets were just so flat. They didn't know what the hell they were doing. And it was curtains early, you know. And I don't want to get on Buck, but while we're here, why David Peterson came out after Bassett, I don't know. I don't understand that. You made it a 3 nothing game to a 4 nothing game for no reason. You were the only left you had in the bullpen at that point. I think Buck had a bad series kind of for the most part, but we'll get into that later. I kind of want to get into, I mean, we could talk one of the biggest parts of game three that has to do with Buck. Um, if you're going to bring him up now. I mean, it's just the decision, the decision, yeah, your gate. Now. I like it. We got about your gate. I don't, I'm just going to go on the record. I don't think he was cheating. That's, do I. that's Vaseline or icy hot to keep himself warm or just some weird pitcher thing. Who knows? Um, I don't know, Jimmy, you were there. Like what was the reaction of the crowd? Do people know what was going on where people think like, could you notice the shiny shit? Cause I noticed it immediately in the first inning 
I don't know what you were at the game, so I wanted to kind of know your perspective on it. I was in five three six, so I couldn't see his <laughs> ear. But um, there, I think there was like behind like a home plate, they probably might have noticed it because that's where I think I heard the cheating stand uh, chance start from. But all over Twitter, you know, everybody had their phones out. So right when Buck came out, and like I feel like everybody kind of knew. Cause then everybody starts talking, everybody's showing everybody the picture of Musgrove's ear on Twitter and stuff on Instagram. Um, even on, it was just all over social media, this, his ear, like what the hell? So we're all looking at this ear and we're like, Oh my God, like he's got something on his ear. Like this guy's going to get out of here. So immediately all the fans just start chanting cheater, cheater, cheater. And I'm like, Oh my God, is Musgrove bad to get tossed? Like what's, what happens? Like, how does, how does that work? Do we get like, like a runner on base, like as a balk, like what's going on? Like, I don't know. Like what's the rule. I've never seen a pitcher actually get kicked out of like a game since this whole rule change. And I don't know. I agree. I don't think it was anything crazy. You know, Andrew McCutcheon came out and said that players use icy hot all the time. And it could have been something like that. And, you know, I mean, it was kind of sus. Like when John boy did break it down. Cause you know, when, uh, when the umpires did come to him, he was like, you know, like that. And then he had a little smirk and it was a funny video, but even like he said, you know, when you watch the game, like he wasn't really going to his ear. And another big thing that I noticed was, and somebody pointed out, I forgot who it was, but um, when he got a new baseball after like a foul ball or anything like that, he wouldn't go to his ear, which is something that, you know, you would do right when you get a new baseball, if you had something on your ear and he didn't do that. So that's why I do think I agree. It's probably icy hot, probably Vaseline, something to just keep his mindset focused. And we're like, you know, like it's like a smell salt, I guess for like a football player, or a hockey player, you know, pitchers, I guess use icy hot as smell salts. But, you know, I think Buck, I don't think it was the wrong move going out there to check on it. I think it was the wrong time. I think if you're going to go out there and you're going to accuse someone of cheating, you don't do it in the sixth inning, getting one hit down four, nothing. You do it. You do it when it's two, nothing in the third inning, because, you know, like even John boy pointed out, Buck was grabbing those balls all game, you know, and even he said after, you know, he's getting information, you know, he's hearing it too. So he's, so he's in on the loop. You know, if you're in on the loop, you're down two nothing you go right away. You know, you're, you, you want to get in his head, you get in his head right away because Bassett, what got in his head was the player stepping out of the box and then he didn't, he didn't like it. And then he walked a bunch of guys. He lost his control. I'm not saying that's what would have happened with Musgrove, but maybe it would have gave a chance. Maybe, maybe it would have gave us a fighting chance. Maybe we get a few guys on base. Maybe we get that lucky single that, you know, that we've got from Cannon or Escobar or somebody at the bottom of the lineup, you know, maybe, but, you know, at the end of the day, they were the better team the last three games of the season, and the Mets were not. And I'm not going to say it was completely Buck's fault, but he did have some questionable decisions. And that David Peterson going in, I agree, Josh. It was weird because you know, it's only 2 nothing. But um, On to the, like, ear thing. I'll just say my piece. It wasn't – it wasn't that. It was <laughs> – and if Mets fans or any Mets fans wants to cling to that, that's cool, but you're masking the fact the team had one hit and two base runners all game. So if guys were having increased spin rates during the 2019, 2020, 2021 season, and yet offense dipped down, but it wasn't impossible to hit someone, you could say that made Musgrove a good pitch to a great pitcher, whatever. But you're just you're making up for the fact that if he had something, it didn't mean that Chris Bassett had to give up three runs and lose control and all the other problems that played the Mets that game. You're just looking for something else to blame for the fact that Mets crapped the bed at the biggest spot of all time. Or at least of this decade so far. <laughs> Biggest spot um, <laughs> of the decade, though, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So no, far. World Series. What are you talking about? No, of this decade, the 2020s, I mean. Oh, oh, okay. So far, at least, that was the biggest game of the decade. And the Mets came out like the little boys, and their diapers were full by the end of the night, and no one changed them midway through the game. So that's on the Mets. That's not on Musgrove cheating or anything like that. So don't tell me that if that's what Mets fans believe, because you're crazy. So obviously we're eliminated. It's the off season now for us, at least some other teams get to play. Um, (laughs) 
I'm embarrassed. I already said that. So I don't want to see a banner at City Field celebrating this wild card series that we just made. Uh, how won't. do you guys feel about that? There's no way they like. Is there one for 2016 in the building? Do we know? There is. Yeah. Oh. I oh. really hope we don't put one up. And if they have a banner ceremony, like did this is a loss where the only way you can avenge that type of loss is by going out and winning a championship in the next two years. I don't know if that's we're just like getting either to the NLDS or getting out of a wild card around. Nope. I feel like that would kind of vanquish those demons. Cohen said three to five years. Next year is year three. Yeah, but I don't think he counted for Jared Porter being uh, a creep and all the other roadblocks that kind of hit the Mets throughout the way. I feel like, but there's no more roadblocks. We got like Max Scherzer yeah, but this is, is year one 39. of this regime. Yeah, but this is thirty. Scherzer's thirty nine. We saw him at the end of the year, so we're already people are worried. It, it Scherzer, we need to capitalize on whatever he has left. So hey, I Jacob. feel like, and Jacob, you know, I really, I don't know what's going to happen with him this off season. I don't know what, what the deal is. I don't know if he wants to leave. He's, he's always said though, he's the only, everyone's, he's never, he's the only one who hasn't said he wants to leave and his agent hasn't said he wants to leave only. Uh, they're only really rumors. So well, <laughs> it's really up to the Mets. I think if the Mets offer up and they offer the most money to Grom will come back to the Mets. If the Mets don't want to Grom, then they don't want him. So I don't think it's a necessary necessarily. Does the Grom want to play for the Mets? It's do the Mets want to Grom and how far are they willing to go? I don't know how true it, that is. I think it is. I think the Grom wants to go wherever the most money is. I think that's, that's the case for most players. And I think with Jacob de Grom, when you when he even said it before this offseason, the plan is to opt out of his contract and be in constant conversation with Steve Cohen and the Mets organization. So I th- I I'm gonna take his word for it and trust him until he proves me otherwise. But for now, I think I think and I'm predicting that Jacob DeGrom will be a New York Met for years to come because I think Cohen does not want to let him lo- he does not want to let him go. We're gonna take and that. If he's receipt. serious about this three to five window three to five year window, which I think he is since, you know, he's made the moves with Lindor with Scherzer, you know, he's likely going to bring back Diaz. I'm not sure what's going on with Nimmo. I'm not really sure what's going on with the outfield situation after this offense, uh, what, what this offense showed, but um, I'd like to see Nimmo back. You know, this team, they had world series makeup this year. They did. Even Max Scherzer said it himself. This team, he's been on multiple teams before championship contending teams. This team felt like that to him. And, you know, when Max Scherzer saying that, I completely agree. So I think this team had the championship makeup. And if they're going to go out there and, you know, if Cohen really wants this three to five year window, he was a year early. So now he has a chance to really get a jump start and have a big off season and put himself, put himself right up there with the Braves and the Dodgers. Cause you know, I think 101 wins, I think we overachieved. You know, I think we're a 90 win team, maybe 92, 93, but I don't think, I think 100 wins is the Mets. We overachieved this year, you know, with the players that we have, you know, we were definitely World Series contenders, but we're also, you know, I think now we're, now you got to realize you got to grab it by the balls basically and, you know, take this team to the promised land, Colin. Josh, you're rolling your eyes a lot. What's up? Well, like, I get what you mean saying, but, like, I'm not going to hold any player to what they say to the press. When they ask the ground, like, hey, do you want to come back next year? And, like, in the in spring training, I'd be like, no, I don't want to be here. Because then the whole year was going to be like, oh, oh, that's weird. Hey, Jake, uh, what? nice to see you in the locker, but what did you say two minutes ago? And when they asked Max, hey, was this a World Series? He was going to be like, no, <laughs> we sucked. You know, he's going to back his boys, as he should. So I personally am not going to hold – any player to what they say to the media for the most part, unless it's a question about how they're feeling or something that they have that's more like earnest, but players got to say what's going to keep them happy and keep the locker room happy and not, you know, ruin things as for the like three to five year window. I think that was Colin being aggressive. And I don't think that means you should try and be more aggressive automatically because he wants to be the East coast Dodgers. The Dodgers were not aggressive the way that Mets fans want the Mets to be aggressive. 
It wasn't going out to sign Aaron Judge. It wasn't <laughs> going out to sign Shohei Otani. It was going like, oh, we'll get Tyler Anderson and we'll trade for Mookie Betts year four out of our, you know, our like rebuild era and finally get into the contender status. But they didn't rush into things because they took it at their own time. They built the system as they came. And the Mets are already feeling the effects of being aggressive because their draft pick this year is 32 instead of 22. So there are consequences to the spending spree that fans want to go on. And I don't begrudge them for wanting it, especially after the Wilpons. But there's a cost. And if you want more than one World Series, the sustainability of it, you have to be patient. I just – I guess my only way, counter argument oh, is – Sorry. Yeah, I'll come to stop the show real quick. Astros did a walk off through a home run against the Mariners one game one. Oh, uh, yep. Sorry. Why couldn't the Mets pick up Scherzer like they pick up Verlander? Oh, <laughs> Jesus. But anyways, the only counter argument I have to that is going into this off season. I think it's a clear agenda. Every, every off season, you know, even with the will ponds, the goal was sign the best player, sign the best player. We're the Mets, you know, we're in New York. We should be signing the best players. And, you know, we do want to win a championship because at the end of the day, we do have a championship makeup right now and you have to go for it. It is championship or bust. Like, it's like, I hate to say it, but I don't even hate to say it. I love to say it now. Steve Cohen has made the New York Mets a world series team or it's the season is a failure because nationally that's how it is. And a lot of people locally feel the same way. I think, you know, with the team that they have, like I said, you bring back Diaz, you got the best closer. You have Lindor. That's like that Mookie Betts. You know, when the Dodgers got Mookie Betts, same thing with Lindor. And then what did the Dodgers do? They got Freddie Freeman. So that's another big-time bat in their lineup. And they already had big-time bats in their lineup before they even had Mookie Betts. So the Mets had Pete Alonso before they had Lindor. So the Mets, they could even be, if you think about it, you sign Aaron Judge, I think the Mets have one of the best offensive lineups in the league. And I know it's – I'm not even trying to troll. I'm not even trying to be a hot take right now. It's like legit. Who's the best player on the in the in the market? Who's the best player in the open market? Aaron Judge. Best player offensively by far that's hit the open market in a long time. Who has the most money in baseball? And what do we need the most? We need a home run hitter and we need a bat. And who's the best home run hitter and who's going to be on, an, on the open market? Aaron Judge. So I'm not even trying to say it to troll Yankee fans – or anything like that. Like, legit, I think Steve Cohen is going to make a serious play for Aaron Judge in the offseason, and I think it's something that we should be excited about because when you think of Aaron Judge, Pete Alonzo, and Francisco Lindor in the same lineup, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Jared, Jared, speak your piece. I want it's to hear ser- like, it's serious. Like, I, we, we are going to have plenty of conversations about Aaron Judge possibly becoming a New York Met. Right now, I mean, I'm just looking at our list of free agents and good ones. We no, I'm like our list, like the guys who are oh, on yeah. our team that are free agents. <laughs> These dudes right here. I'd take Aaron Judge over any of them though. Um <laughs> and I think James, you're right. The expectation, the standard is it's 86. Like we 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 gotta win a World Series. Like that's we have to be better than that team. Like any team that falls short of the World Series. It's a failure. They don't reach the standard that the 86 Mets set. Josh. The smart build. I agree. Think about what the Will Ponds did. Can I just interject real quick? So yes. I'm going to read you the, the top players from the 2018 Dodgers who made the World Series. Ready? Max Turner, cast off. Max Muncy, or sorry, Justin Turner, cast off. Max Muncy, cast off. Chris Taylor cast off. Cody Bellinger drafted. Clayton Kershaw drafted. Walker Buehler drafted. Yasmany Grandal cast off. Kike Hernandez. I'm not really sure. Manny Hernandez or Manny Hernandez. Manny Machado trade deadline acquisition. Hinjin Ryu signing. That is what the Dodgers did, and it's how they're still doing this. It's not by going to sport for Aaron Judge. It's outsmarting everyone else. And I, I want you to make your point, Jared or Jimmy. Oh, I'm so. But Machado's a star, just like Judge, though. Yeah, but the, the trend, Dodgers didn't let him walk. He still made the World Series. I'm just saying, yeah, but, I think you've got to invest in the scouting department in the front office first before you can just spend everything. But Jared, please. Okay. This is kind of exactly what you were saying. Like the Will Ponds, like 2007, our rotation, and like 2007, 2006, like our rotation was injured. 
Tom Glavin shit the bed in the last game of 07. So, like, we need a starting arm. They give Johan Santana a shit ton of money. Santana, a good Met, a memorable Met. Didn't win. Year after, the Mets blow another late game, miss the 2008 playoffs. Oh, our bullpen sucks. Go by Francisco Rodriguez. Still didn't win. <laughs> Year or two later, Mets have no offense. Oh, we need a guy who can hit home runs. We need a bat. And they get Jason Bay. I can't even say, besides seeing his number, like his jersey in the stadium, I can't give you one signature Jason Bay Mets moment because they didn't win. So like those quick fixes, getting like a big name guy to come in and like he's going to change everything immediately and you don't address the other issues and have like a well, nice balanced team. That's where I'm a little hesitant to be like, we got to go after judge. Obviously we should talk to him. We should be in the running because we have the money and it's bad baseball. It's bad business. If you don't try to get the best players for your team, but I think there's a lot of merit um, in one, keeping a good amount of the guys that we have now. I would love for us to re-sign Brandon Nimmo. He earned it. He's a homegrown guy. We need homegrown people. Edwin Diaz, I mean, it's going to be hard for him to replicate any type of season that he had this year, but he's going to be one of the best close. He's he's still going to be one of the best closers in baseball. And if we have the ability to re-sign him, we should. Um, DeGrom, pay the man. We've already talked about it enough. I'm going to talk about him, but like, you know, the other names like Seth Lugo, Chris Bassett, Taiwan Walker, Trevor May, Trevor Williams, Michael Givens, Joely Rodriguez. Like, these are like, we could have like eight or not. We could have a whole new pitching staff next year, um, that we have to address. And I personally want some quality there. Like, I want to invest in that because the bullpen was an issue that we had this year. And actually, the bullpen played very well in the wild card series. It's not something we really got to talk about. But we don't really need to talk yep. about it anymore. Um, but literally, we could just have Scherzer be the only starting pitcher left on this team from next year. Like this, you know, there's, I feel like there's bigger things. Obviously, we do need a bat. Um, but I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm more in favor of, you know, spending money wisely and, you know, because that's what they do with Canna and Marte and Escobar. Like, yeah, but they didn't overpay. They spent well, and a couple of them contributed all at their certain points of the season. Um, and I think they still need to go about doing it a smart way. And you know, thankfully, they kept Alvarez and uh, Beatty. Uh, maybe Mauricio gets called up eventually, or we use him for a trade. Or Vientos, after having kind of a full spring of in the season, can <laughs> add some pop and power. And you know. Alvarez will probably see him in the starting lineup. We'll probably see him. Maybe he'll make the team next year. Like, I don't see him. He's not going to stay in AAA or AA anymore. And same with Beatty. Um, so there's, I don't know. We, we got a lot going for us. I would really like to keep this nucleus together before we go out and try to grab some other people. That's just me. I just think, though, you said it like the way you said it. I agree. Like, we've got Francisco Rodriguez, we sucked. We got Jason Bay, we sucked. We got Johan, we sucked. But here's the difference. We already have a good team. But like, most, we, I just, like, they're all going to be gone. We have no, so we, much we, we have, we have Star Star Marte. Out. We got a lot of work to do. You sign Aaron Judge. You're your three starting outfielders. Aaron Judge, Starlin Marte, Mark Hanna. So he's replacing Brandon Nimmo. I'm sorry. I love Brandon Nimmo, homegrown guy. I'm taking Aaron Judge 10 times out of 10, maybe even 3,000 times out of 10 because he hit 311, slugged 686, and no, the 62 home runs. Like, yeah, Can I but make like, a point, Jimmy? No, that wait, hold cool. on. I gotta Who's your pitching staff? Who's your pitching staff then? Dude, but here's I, this is where I finish. This is my other thing. Cohen has said before he does not care about going over the luxury tax. In the new CBA, <laughs> in the new CBA, there's another – you can go over past the luxury tax for another third tier. They added an extra tier. So now Cohen, if he really wants the, if he really wants this three to five window, like he said, go get Jacob Degrom, go get Aaron Judge. You win the off season, and you will likely win the World Series because there's no better That's lineup. Not how it works, Jimmy? It is how it works. You get Aaron Judge. No. You put, <laughs> if you put Aaron Judge on this team over Brandon Nimmo right now, are they in the World Series? Are they going to I the World Series? I can't answer that, dude. But you can't either. Like, okay, Judge is the best hitter in the. Major League Baseball, like he, it's that he's simple. also missed like two full seasons. But does he? No, oh no, he no, no, 
He he was hurt. <laughs> he was hurt. He's played 155 games, 112, 102, 28 in 2020, but that was 2020, and then 148 last year and 157. So the only times he's played less than 100 games was his rookie season and the COVID year. Brandon Nimmo has played in less than 100 games so many times. Yeah, but also, like, Aaron Judge is 6'7", and he's going to be 31. I, Brandon like, Nimmo is up there, too. How old is Brandon I'm Nimmo? Not gonna, he's like, <laughs> we have so much time for this for this argument. There's It's going to be a long offseason. I know. It's going to be I'm very just, long. I'm on the board with, I don't care what the Mets do. They could go grab a garbage man and a plumber and an <laughs> electrician to play third base and, and freaking DH. You get Aaron Judge and you bring back Jacob DeGrom, and Edwin Diaz, you're going to be right back at the top of the NLEs, and you're going to be fighting for a World Series much better than they were last year. This I year. think it'll be like 89 and whatever. I think they'd be worse. Like Judge, Aaron Judge, <laughs> Pete Alonzo. The two 130 RBIs, we thought it was crazy with Lindor and Alonzo. I mean, Lindor and Alonzo. Think about the three of them together. That's over 400 RBIs from the three of them alone. And he has the money to do it. I think if he has the money to do it, would you already got Starlin Marte? It's not like when you sign when they signed Jason Bay because when they signed Jason Bay, this team sucked. Like they didn't have a catcher. Josh Tolley was their catcher. Like you know, we got Pete Alonso who just led the league in RBIs. You know, we got Lindor. We got Scherzer. We can. We're probably going to bring back Diaz because Diaz loves New York and you know Cohen. He's a money maker, and Diaz just—he's a workhorse. And the trumpets—that's a money maker. So, um, but yeah, I'll say this, and then we'll end the discussion. I guess as we got other stuff to move on to. Uh, two teams had two guys in the top ten of the NL and RBI. The Mets and the Cardinals—they both lost in the first round. RBIs and offense doesn't make a team. If you spend on Judge, you're sacrificing in other areas, significant areas in the starting rotation and the bull, the bullpen. And just because you better one thing doesn't mean the whole team is better to me. It's just not – it's not how you build a sustainable team of, like, knocking your draft pick back 20 picks every year. We talked about earlier this year about, hey, man, Mets have a good draft class apparently with Jet Williams, Kevin Parada, some of the other guys, Blaze Tidwell, awesome we game. Great, we, got, we got great prospects too that are going to play next year. They will play Because a lot. they drafted well. They didn't knock their pick back down and down and down because they wanted to spend money. And we could talk about this later, and I'll bring it up again. But they spent like twenty six million dollars combined on Mark Canna, Eduardo Escobar, and Adam Ottavino. That is smart signing, not signing just because you're overreacting to what happened in the season. But, but I, we can move on now. That did not get us anywhere, though. <laughs> Neither will <sighs> Judge Will. Okay, Judge okay. Will. Hey, we can do a whole free agency show. We could. We could even do a whole show just talking about Aaron Judge, and it could be Jimmy and Josh going on a full debate. I'll moderate it. You guys can wear That's gonna blow us up. I don't care. I'll I'll bring a gavel. It, it could be a whole I'll thing. I'll the top button on this. If we're going to do a judge right show, now. though, we have to do a DeGrom show, I feel like, because there's a lot of Mets fans who don't oh, want DeGrom course. back. We'll we got, we got to we gotta be his lawyers. <sighs> All right. So, with the two minutes we have left. We can go over. I mean, this is this – is, oh, if true, any show is worth going over. We can go over. All right. Yeah. But – Trying to move, you know, trying to look at the season holistically. Um, I don't know. Like Jimmy said a bunch, but is this is this season a failure? Jared, I'll let you go first because I, I if I want to hear your take first because I feel like always because you're the host guy, it's like how it goes. You always third banana. I want you to get that first bite today. <laughs> Unless you don't have an answer prepared. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I do. I do. Well, I'm kind of, okay. I'm going to think out loud a little bit, but um, I said at the beginning of the wild card show, like all the great things we did, 100 plus wins, you know, guys leading statistical categories, batting titles, no hitters, just one. It all meant nothing if we didn't get out of this wild card series. And it, it, it is. It's, it's great. I think it's a failure, but. The great thing is about sports and life is that you learn from your failures. This team is taking steps in the right direction. Um, and you know, Cohen said it's a plan, and New York Mets in the 80s, 83, Doc and Daryl came up, 
They traded for Keith Hernandez at the trade deadline. I want to say in 84, they got Carter, which was like at the time the Mets never got any big star in a trade or anything. And they got Gary Carter, which was like unheard of. Like the most, like the Mets finally got a guy that was like going to make a difference. 85, they get in a really close pennant race with the St. Louis Cardinals, who were a great team that year. They fall a couple games short. Then 86 was the prove it year for them to do it. And I think this year is one of those 84, 85s. Um, And maybe next year, the year after, will be an 86. Who knows? But I think this team is going in the right direction as much as it hurts right now. um, And as much as pain as everyone is in and how classic it is and all the chirps and the memes of yeah the Mets had a really cool closer song this year like uh, we're going the right direction I think there's definitely some things to feel good about and you know all you can do is extract the positives and learn from the negatives you know sure do you want to or Jimmy do you want to go next or should I um yeah you can go okay um the answer to that question is no to me. I don't think the season was a failure at all. And while I really understand where you guys are coming from and why a bunch of other fans are saying that, I think we need to wind the clock back here. We're going full 30 for 30 mode right here. What if last I season? <laughs> what if I last season? That, <laughs> <laughs> last season, the Mets won 77 games. They lost Jacob DeGrom and his team winning 5.1 B war halfway through the season. He still led the team. That's how bad we were. Okay, they saw Francisco Lindor hit 230 with the lowest OPS of his career in the first year of a 10 year extension. They saw Jeff McNeil at 251. David Peterson pitched to a 5.54 ERA after a strong rookie season. And then in the offseason, the Mets had to cope with the losses of Aaron Whoop, Javier Baez, Jonathan Villar, and Marcus Stroman, all of whom were top 10 in B War on the Mets that season. Oh, and they need to find a manager and they need to find a new GM. That's a lot. <laughs> That's not including figuring out if Steve Cohen could spend his money on the right players at the right amount. What happened? The Mets got clarity is what happened this season. Cohen showed he could attract big name players in Scherzer and Marte. He, Epler, and Alderson proved they could spend on the fringes by spending $27.25 million on Escobar, Cannon, Otto Vino for a combined 6.2 F4. They then hired Buck Showalter and went to the Austin they traded for Chris Bassett. In the season itself, Lindor earned his money at the single greatest season by Mets shortstop in franchise history. Pete Alonso solidified himself as one of the best first basemen in baseball. Jeff McDean won a bad title. Go squirrel. Um, <laughs> Brennan Nemo showed he's worthy of an extension. Luis Guillorme wasn't quite Babe Ruth, but he flashed signs of progress. David Peterson cemented himself as a future member of the rotation, which is why it can, it's okay if we lose Carrasco or Walker now. You now know Peterson can at least pitch in the big leagues again. The Mets won 101 games. Made to the playoffs for the first time since 2016, will win presumably NL Manager of the Year and change the entire narrative about who they are. If you don't think that's progress for the franchise, I don't know what to tell you other than I'm sorry. But I know that if you told the Mets in the wild in spring training that they would lose the wild card, I think most people would say that makes sense. Now our route to that destination really, really sucks. It was not pretty. Of that, I can completely agree with you guys. And in so many ways, how easily you could snub at the end of this season depends on what happens this offseason. But I don't, I think saying this season the failure is discounting all the progress this team made as a franchise by the players' way. Everything about it, I don't, I, I'm not worried about Francisco Endor anymore. Last offseason, I was petrified. We just signed a dude to another Albatross contract like Jason Bay. That does not make a season a failure to me. And it's like I said, I think what happens this offseason is going to be huge about. Is this the Mets' best shot in the next five years? We'll find out. But I just can't say this is a failure when so much good things happened. Fair. I'm going to say it's a failure, obviously. <laughs> I think that was expected. Um, yeah, I mean, when you win 101 games and you're in first place for basically the whole entire season until the last six games, and then you lose the way you did, you know, I hate to say it, but the Mets collapsed. You know, this was it, it's it is what it is, you know. I hate it, I, I like I said, I hate to say it, but it was it it's just a collapse. It wasn't a choke. Like it was a choke, but it was just a complete collapse. We were here all the way and then pfft, crashed. You know, and I think it was a uh, you know, I get the progress thing. 
But at the end of the day, going into this season, the goal wasn't to make progress. The goal was to win a World Series. You know, that's everybody's goal. Players go in to win. And, you know, after, especially with the season that we had, with the season we had, the regular season, the way that we were playing, you know, we got Scherzer, we got DeGrom, we got, you know, DeGrom might not come back now. Um, but I, I want him to, but he might not. Um, you know, Diaz, he's probably coming back, but he's a free, he's going to be a free agent. Nimmo's going to be a free agent. We got all these guys who are going to be free agents. So I really think this year we did have, like Scherzer even said, this team had championship makeup. They could have got there. And, you know, when you sign Scherzer, you're not trying to make progress. You're trying to win a World Series. You know, that's that's what it is. And when you have Jacob deGrom, you want to win a World Series. When you have the best closer in baseball, you want to win a World Series. When you have the NL batting champion, MLB batting champion, you want to win the World Series. So that's why I'm saying it's a failure. But after taking a few days to think of it, I think it depends really what the Mets do. If... In the next, she's, with uh, me. she's like, no, it wasn't a failure, Jimmy. Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, like Jared said, though, in the next couple of years, if especially next year, and then and the year after that, if one of those years they win a World Series, then I'm going to look back on this 2022 season and say, all right, well, this is where, you know, it started. You know, this is where this era of this championship team really started to begin because this is really when Cohen, you know changed this franchise he changed the way Mets fans think of their team and view their team which is amazing you know so that's why I also do agree with you Josh on it is a success because you know there's like that's why I'm looking at two ways like in 2022 yes failure but long term I think I completely agree you know I think if they can win in the future and Cohen you know with the way that he just changed this team from literally the laughing stock of the MLB and, you know, bear hasn't won a world series since 86, blah, 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 blah. You know, we always get clowned on. Well, he turned us into a serious championship contender, not just this year, but for years to come. And I think as Mets fans, we should all be excited because we're going to be watching. I know I hate to say this too, but we're going to be watching fun <laughs> baseball for a lot, a lot more years. And, um, uh, I'm very happy that Cohen, uh, bought this team and with the direction it is going in. I'm 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 actually pleasantly surprised by your your optimism. Um Jimmy. I am too. Um yeah that was I think I think we're all on the same page here. It's you know World Series or not like this was this was a good year. I think you you can't deny like even looking at the highlights we played at the beginning of the show. It's a lot of great moments, a lot of happy moments, a lot of a lot of times where you know it's just like joy like I don't know. It's it's gonna suck not being able to sit on like no more afternoon baseball, you know. No more two o'clock games. No more no more double headers. It's gotta we just gotta wait till April what twenty fourth or eighteenth or who knows. Um, <laughs> too long. Too long. But it's a it's a new era, and you know this season or not, it's it's growing pains, and I think. Who knows? Maybe Buck Showalter will leave after two years, and whoever we bring in next will win a World Series because that seems to happen to him all the time. So <laughs> <laughs> everywhere but the Orioles, the Orioles immediately were just like, "We don't want to be a team anymore." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they got you know, they, this year. They made a little, uh, made a little That's push. I made some noise. I'll and you know see... Go ahead. I saw the Baltimore Orioles. The Athletic posted a list: top seven teams to sign Jacob Degrom, and they they just threw the Baltimore Orioles in there. I don't think. Well, okay, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I think they just threw. They literally threw him oh, in there, and the, like the headline was. <laughs> I'm not like, talking about. I, I'm not just gonna leave that be. <laughs> um, I will concede the end of the season is a failure, but the season itself was not. Everything you're saying, Jimmy, how can that not be considered a success though? If we, I, I don't know. Like, if you told me in spring training, hey, the Mets are gonna win 101 games. You're not. You're gonna figure out everything you know about these players on this roster. You have a really solid core now. You may not have won the World Series, but 29 other teams don't either. Only one team does. And the thing you, I think we have to remind ourselves is that if you look at the history of sports and all the teams who won a World Series or any championship at any level, it's very, very rarely a, oh, well, they're good. Oh, they're, they just won the World Series or the whatever championship you want to be. It is a buildup. It is a climb. It's arduous. It's painful. It's rocky. You'll probably stub your fingers and cut yourself on the way. 
but a lot of teams make it because they go through that. And this season is um, the end of it really is like lighting Coca-Cola on my body and then letting fire ants crawl over me. Um, but, <laughs> but that is the steps and you have to only hope that the players can now go into those moments next year. If they make the playoffs, we're back to if, um, and go, Hey, we've been here. We know how to do this. Look what Houston did today against the, C- the Seattle Mariners went down early. They went, Hey, we've been in this situation before it's the playoffs. We know how to do this. And they climbed themselves out and won. That's what the one that we can hope for the Mets. It's not tangible. Hope is just that it's hope. But that's all we have to hang on to. And I guess, you know, I hate saying it because I think it's the stupidest slogan in sports. You got to believe. Yeah. I mean, more hope than before. So it's funny, like what you just said, Josh. All we have is hope. And if you look at it, nothing's really changed (laughs) from this year to the Wilpon era to now. All we got is hope. Can I? I, What you got to do is clarify. When I say you got to believe it's a terrible slogan, I do mean that. I know I'm going to catch flack for it, but like, Get hold out. on. I know, Jared. I see K- your face. Kick him out. Kick him out. Don't tell me I got to believe in anything when this team's been putrid for the last like 30 years. All right. I just <laughs> make me believe. How about that? Make me believe. That's, for the most part. That should be on a towel on opening freaking day. Make me make me believe. Someone hired me on the Mets because I'd be like, don't listen to Jimmy. Don't sign Aaron Judge. Uh, make me believe is, is step two. These Mets, no, no, you're you're jinxing yourself. <laughs> These Mets are now those Mets, and I never want to hear that again. Yeah, and whoever did make that decision really has to be fired. And if they aren't, I never call for people to get fired, but that person should be fired. <laughs> and how out. hard is it to be like instead of th- these Mets, we believe just there, it's right there for you, or just like the one from 2015. Let's go Mets. Yes, I mean, you can't it's, it's, it. it's okay. Yeah, LFGM, well, let's go just Mets. Make, right make there. those towels. Easy. Simple fix. I think that about does it for the show, unless anyone else has anything else they want to say. No. Let's go, um, Guardians. Let's go. I'm not watching any baseball. I don't know about you guys. I'm, I'm done. Oh, come on, man. I just I need something to get me through these next couple of weeks. I'll be honest. I walked into Monday, and I woke up, and I felt like a zombie. I didn't want to talk to my parents. I didn't want to talk to anyone. And when I did, I was very short sentences. It was like, yep. I'm gonna make breakfast now, okay? And that was it. I'll watch the I'll watch the championship series. I need a break. I just need a break. Good, good. But anyway, good um, the Mets way is not going to go away this off season. We got plenty of stuff to talk about. Huge free agency. Um, probably talk a little bit, maybe about the playoffs if we want. Um, I don't know. We'll figure out as we go. But wow, what a season it's been! And the show has come a very long way. <laughs> a very, very long way. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I look forward to the Aaron Judge episode. I'm going to start typing like my legal notes tonight. <laughs> Call some lawyers, maybe some Saul Goodman. Give, give me some, some Saul here. Goodman. Oh my god, I'm going to watch that now tonight. <laughs> for that, we definitely need like the Law and Order bump bump to, to <laughs> the intro for sure. <laughs> Speedy baseball for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and re- is Terrence Gore free agent? No. I mean, that dude's probably just homeless. He probably just moves from town to town looking for teams. <laughs> Never got to he's see got, him. He's back. got a really – he's got a mansion uh, RV. That's what yeah. I would do if I was him. Just take it on the road. We're just living a private jet. <laughs> you know who wouldn't have swung at a foul pitch and then not let us see Terrence Gore try and steal James McCann? Because he wouldn't have made contact. <laughs> oh, no. That, that double play. First pitch swinging. Yeah. James McCann wouldn't do that. Nope. True. <laughs> Because he can't hit the ball, but it's all right. Maybe he will next yeah, year. That's... Who knows? Maybe James McCann flips the switch. A lot of things to look forward to next year, boys. A lot of things. <sighs> well, that about does it for the Mets way. Season recap. Wild card recap. Yep. Yeah. Stay tuned for more episodes coming up soon. Yes, sir.